both class and caste have economic uh, dimensions. Both class and caste have political and cultural dimensions. Both class and caste have uh, consequences uh, around natural issues. So how do we, you know, when we put these two together, how do we get a, a richer analysis? You know, that is the project. My name is Vamsi Vakulavarnam. I teach economics at the University of Massachusetts, Amherst. I was a grantee at uh, Institute for New Economic Thinking. Uh, and I'm also co-directing the Asian political program at uh, uh, the University of Massachusetts Amherst. I'm working on this project uh, called Class and Inequality in India and China. And uh, it's actually a forthcoming book. Uh, and uh, so this book is all about uh, how to view inequality related issues in China and India through the lens of class um, and uh, Marxian uh, understanding of class. And, and uh, uh, there's a lot of work on inequality in China. Uh, and there's also a lot of work on inequality in India. But there's very little work uh, that uh, uh, focuses on the axis of class. And what it uh, does is, you know, apart from helping us uh, characterize these economies, uh, you know, in, in class regimes, uh, it also throws light on the deeper social dynamics you know, that drive the economic processes in both these countries. And on top of it, uh, it also helps us understand the nature of the state, nature of the Chinese state, uh, nature of the Indian state uh, in class terms. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, uh, doing this uh, uh, analysis uh, also gives us an insight into within country inequality dynamics. Uh, so this is, you know, if you, if you take the big thinkers on inequality like uh, Simon Kuznets or uh, Thomas Piketty, uh, you know, they, they posit, you know, a, a secular kind of relationship, you know, over, uh, you know, between, let's say, level of income of a country and the inequality patterns. Kuznets says, you know, it's an inverted U-shaped uh, curve. Inequality rises first and then declines. Uh, and uh, in the case of Piketty, uh, he argues that after a decline in the middle of the 20th century, you know, inequality is continuously rising. So my argument is a little bit different. Using uh, class analysis, I argue that you know it's uh, the particular nature of capitalist crises uh, that drive inequality regimes. Depending on the nature of the crisis, uh, a particular kind of inequality regime uh, you know is unleashed, which either you know uh, leads to rising inequality or uh, it could also lead to declining inequality. It, it depends on the particular institutional configuration that emerges in response to a particular capitalist crisis. So, so using class, you know, gives us, you know, all these rich uh, dynamics of the underlying economies of China and India. So another forthcoming book that I have uh, is uh, uh, with uh, a co-author, Sripad Motinam, uh, is uh, titled uh, tentatively, Vanishing Mosaics, uh, Changing Landscapes of Indian Cities. And uh, this, so this is, uh, you know, we adopt a, a novel approach, uh, you know, uh, and this approach is, uh, you know, broadly it can be called a socio-spatial dialectical approach where, uh, uh, you know, we take multiple social axes uh, and we take spatial axes uh, and then we see how they interact in producing economic or uh, social outcomes. So we look, in particular, we look at, uh, you know, the axes of gender, uh, religion, uh, class and caste in the uh, in the Indian context, and see how city space interacts with each of these axes. So, to, just to give you a couple of examples, um, so uh, when you take something like gender, uh, you know, uh, and and how city space interacts with gender, uh, the the key uh, insight is that uh, you know uh, city spaces are uh, very gendered, uh, you know, and and uh, uh, it, it actually has uh, a uh, significant impact on uh, uh, something as basic as, you know, labor force participation rates of women. Uh, so uh, depending on how the city space is structured, we are comparing two cities in India, Bombay and uh, uh, Mumbai right now, uh, and Hyderabad. Uh, Mumbai has much better public transportation infrastructure. Uh, so women could, uh, you know, therefore, you know, participate more actively in the labor market uh, compared to Hyderabad, compared to women in Hyderabad. 
uh, or you know, uh, uh, it, it could also be you know proximity. You know, uh, are there work opportunities in in you know, the city neighborhood where women reside? Uh, that determines their labor force participation rate. Similarly, uh, if you take uh, the axis of religion, uh, what we found uh, about Indian cities is uh, Muslims are uh, you know ghettoized, and the ghettoization process is uh, you know deepening in the Indian context right now. And uh, uh, we also know, uh, you know, our our primary, you know, major insight, uh, you know, is that you know, mo uh, if neighborhoods, city neighborhoods, you know, uh, something like sub districts or wards, comparable to census tracts in Western countries, uh, at at those levels, if you have more mixed neighborhoods, it has a uh, very significant outcome, which is there are better development outcomes in the for the people who live in these mixed neighborhoods. So, for instance, you know what we found is uh, you know poverty outcomes are much better. You know there are fewer poor people in more, uh, if the neighborhoods are more mixed, uh, or you know there are better educational opportunities uh, if neighborhoods are more mixed. So it's it's uh, what we find is you know whether it is religion, whether it is uh, something like caste, you know uh, the social group, uh, social kind of grouping in India, uh, uh, when the neighborhood becomes more mixed. Uh, you know there are better development outcomes, and one striking finding. You know we compared uh, uh, you know similar geographical city tracts in the Western countries and uh, and Indian cities, uh, something like census tract here and you know uh, uh, ward or uh, sub district in Indian cities. And what we find is Indian neighborhoods uh, tend to be much more mixed, uh, and Western city neighborhoods are much more segregated. Uh, so, but then you know, over the last thirty years, you know, with uh, with uh, economic reforms, the neoliberal economic reforms, uh, you know, segregation processes are also deepening in Indian cities. So, our work, uh, you know, highlights the the uh, nature of Indian cities, nature of these landscapes, and also how these landscapes are undergoing change quickly. Uh, so, using these four axes, the social axes of uh, religion, gender, class, and caste. And uh, making them interact with city space, uh, we are able to uh, arrive at this outcome. And it, there's also a lot of policy advocacy uh, work that can come out of you know uh, these insights. Partly coming out of this uh, uh, you know uh, uh, book, uh, I've also been thinking about a, a deeper theoretical question, uh, which is uh, you know how do uh, you know in India there are a lot of thinkers who uh, privilege class. Uh, you know, Marxist thinkers or communist parties that privilege uh, the category of class, um, and they argue that this is the only axis that matters. You know, to understand society, uh, and and or the primary, you know, the fundamental axis. Whereas there are lots of uh, other kinds of thinkers, you know, uh, social theorists, activists who privilege caste, and there's no unity. You know, there's a lack of trust between you know these two groups, although they seem to be working. On similar issues, you know, issues of backwardness, issues of uh, lack of privilege, issues of lack of dignity, uh, issues surrounding exploitation in the workplace, uh, they don't uh, see eye to eye. So this uh, work, you know, trying to develop some kind of a, uh, you know, a composite way of thinking about both class and caste together, uh, it it'll uh, bring in, you know, the strengths of class analysis. You know, for instance, you know, how do we analyze the Indian capitalism? You know what are the class dynamics that underlie Indian capitalism, and uh, what are the social dynamics? You know that have uh, been uh, part of the Indian context for a very long time. How do you bring these two together theoretically, and and using class caste uh, in a composite sense? How do we make an analysis of Indian? Uh, you know, let's say the social formation that is Indian capitalism. So, uh, so that is you know an ongoing project. You know this is. Uh, uh, going to be written in the you know next one or two years, a and uh, it's it's a it you know a lot of uh, on the ground kind of work practice uh, has uh, uh, worked with something like uh, you know both class and caste issues uh, fused uh, you know in 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 an activist space or a policy space, uh, but it has not been adequately theorized yet. People talk about the importance of both, but you know so for instance something like you know. Both class and caste have economic uh, dimensions. Both class and caste have political and cultural dimensions. Uh, both class and caste have uh, consequences uh, 
around natural issues. So how do we, you know, when we put these two together, how do we get a, a richer analysis? You know, that is the project. And, and uh, this could also feed off from and feed into, uh, you know, composite uh, analysis, let's say in the American or European context, combining class and race or class and gender, right? So, so how do we combine two axes, right? So that would be the theoretical contribution.